this is, this is, this is. All right, welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Mike Herrera. Great to be here. 395. We're, we're edging ever so closer to episode 400. Not that I'm really counting, but uh, I don't know. I just like to, I don't like to be, I like to be past things. <laughs> it's like anything that's coming up. I'm like, I, I wish that was over. <laughs> Uh, speaking of which, MXPX is playing some shows coming up April 1st and 2nd. That is coming up sooner than you realize. I know we have a couple months, but really, just every week that goes by, it's that much closer. MXPX, Zebrahead, Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and Mercy Music, both shows. April 1st, Anaheim, California at the Anaheim House of Blues, and then April 2nd at the Marquee Theater in Phoenix, Arizona. Go to mxpx.com for tickets. Would love to see you guys there. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait for it. It's gonna be fun. I, I got a lot to do. A lot of things still on the to-do list, as always. But, you know, I've done a few things since last week. I know I was talking about it last week a little bit, but um, thank you guys for uh, for listening. I wonder what you're up to this week. I'm... I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm working on a pretty fun project, actually, that you guys are going to hear. If not already, um, you're going to hear soon. Um, but uh, I'm not going to say anything more about it. Let's put that to bed. Uh, but let's get to uh, let's get to the podcast. We're going to hear from you. Voicemails. Yes, January voicemails. And uh, I wanted to uh, just find out what you guys wanted to talk about, and we'll talk about it. So let's get to it. Um, the first voicemail. Here we go. Ready? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Hey, Mike. Uh, my name's Andy Pollard. I'm from Montana. Um, I've uh, been a huge fan for a long time. Uh, slowly going away, the Buffalo is my favorite record. Um, before everything and after, was I got that when I was 12, and it was kind of the first record that made me fall in love with punk rock, and it was all downhill. All downhill from there, I assume? is in the tumble down episodes talking about uh your stop in billings montana on your way at the end of the tour back to washington uh i remember it well because that was at the coffee shop in billings that i used to hang out at and i remember the story you told of how basically you had to leave the van running so you ran in played the show and ran out that was an insane for those that don't know that story tumble down on I think it was really our the one of the last runs we did out east, and we we played we played uh, Biz, Bismarck Mont- somewhere Bismarck North Dakota, um, I think I think that's where we played, and and then the the next day we uh, it was so cold there our our uh, our van started up fine but then when we went to breakfast. We parked on like a snow drift or something. I don't know what happened, but parked on a snow drift. So when we came out, our engine wouldn't start, would not start. So we got it towed to a Sears type thing. I think it was Sears in a mall in Bismarck, North Dakota. And we're we're there like half a day. We were supposed to be driving home uh, and actually driving to this show, Billings, Montana. Um, We ended up finally getting it started and he's like man this starter it was frozen you know we had to wait for it to get thought out all this now you know i if i was you i wouldn't i wouldn't uh turn it off until you're ready to let it sit for a minute because it's not going to start back up if you start it so we start on the road from bismarck north dakota to billings montana and we have i guess we have a, a day a, I guess we have that we have that night we have to get there I don't remember if it was that night the show or if we had a whole day and I'm not sure what the drive is um, I should have I didn't know I was going to be talking about this but I would have looked up the drive and been able, been able to figure it out but at any at any rate we were late to the show and we're just like we're trying to get there it's ice the whole way we have a van and trailer we can't turn it off so when we go and fill up gas we're literally pulling up to the pump gassing up our tank while the engine is running. I know this is frowned upon, it's not safe, but that's what we had to do. So I was like, what are we gonna do? And that was it. So we were on that program and we stopped it. We got off the freeway in Billings, Montana, and it was, the snow was still coming down and 
and off the the highway it was you know it wasn't plowed or I, I mean it was icy and, and snowy it, maybe a little bit of sand on the highway but uh it, you, you know it was always covered always getting covered uh but down in town it was like all snowy and so we're going down this like sort of like main strip in Billings and we had to turn around to get to the venue and we park we park out just in, in front of the venue we didn't even go up into the parking lot we parked on the street <laughs> and there was this bar this bar like you know uh I, I guess it was like we they they we were supposed to be playing a show and they pushed us back and there was another show after our show and we're like oh my god well, we'll be there almost in time for our set. We're just a little late. But we played a short set, but we, we went in there, we loaded in, and we left our van running the whole time, the whole show. We had a key fob, beep, beep, so we could lock the van while it was running. We had, you know, two two or three sets of keys. So, yeah, I guess I remember that pretty well. And and that wasn't the end of it. The, the drive itself was hell. It was, like, so stressful and... And we were after that show in in Billings. We left, and there was a a, a, a Beatles cover band, a Beatles slash Led Zeppelin cover band. They mixed and matched Beatles and Led Zeppelin songs together in a cool way. And I remember, you know, all of us in Tumbledown, we all wanted to watch that show, but we're like, we can't. We're already we're already late for one, and it's snowing, and we're just this is going to take a long time to get home. And and sure enough, it did. But we made it all the way back to Bremerton, crawling mostly the whole way. And the worst, honestly, the worst was when we got through Gorst into Bremerton. Uh, well, Port Orchard was really bad too, but we were we were riding on the, the rumble strips ju, 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 the whole way. And when we got into Bremerton was when we finally had to pull over and put on chains because we couldn't go any further. And that was a really brutal session because we didn't know how to do it. We're, that's why we didn't do it the whole way. We're like, we're, we're going we're gonna to be out here a while. We had had, we had had a very bad, a bad, bad experience on a previous tour in the California mountains. Uh, I guess it would be like Shasta area or somewhere in there. And um, that's a whole different story. I won't, maybe I should go into it, but, <laughs> but, uh, but the, uh, we had had this bad experience before, and so that made us not want to put on the chains. And then we finally had to, that we couldn't get any further. We were literally across the street from the studio here in Bremerton, and uh, we had to like go and drop everybody off. And after we, so we put on the chains, got that done, dropped everybody off. Um, the Trotlands got, we, we dropped them off at like a gas station or like a supermarket where their, one of their folks came and got them. But, um, the uh, once I finally got home, and at, the, at this point I was living in East Bremerton. I live in, I don't live in East Bremerton anymore. But uh, that's not important, is it? But I would, had to go all the way over to the east side, and I was in Minette and parked it in our driveway in the back, like back behind our garage, and uh, went in just tired, just did, you know, end of the day, didn't want to think about it. The next morning I came back and it wasn't, it was cold. It was cold and snowy everywhere in Washington, by the way. It was cold and snowy everywhere, everywhere we were that winter. <laughs> but uh, it really started, Bismarck was really bad and it got worse and worse as we got went west because the storm was continuing on. So Bremerton was really bad and I went out there the next morning and sure enough, kick, 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 no start. It would not start and I got it towed to, I had AAA luckily. And so uh, I got it towed to shop, you know, and uh, they had to replace the, the starter. It was like completely burnt out or frozen out or something like that. It just didn't work. So, um, you know, just the whole idea of not ever turning your car off, getting gas, playing shows, <laughs> doing a tour, never turning off. Uh, you know, not a lot of things do that, but I was amazed that it actually worked. And it was... I think it was a white, um, a white Econoline style Chevy van, you know, the kind that has like the extra seating and stuff like that. You know, it was really kind of cushy. It was pretty, pretty cool. Um, anyway, 
That was amazing. It, let, let's continue. You weren't done, Andy, so uh, I'll let you let you continue on. I had to miss that show, so I was super bummed. So it was really fun to hear the story of it. Uh, yeah, I love that. So my question is, um, are memories from tours like that that were really hard and kind of drag it out, uh, are they funner and sweeter than memories from tours that had more uh, cushy accommodations and were easier? Uh, which, which do you think back more fondly of? Thanks, man. Keep up the good work. Oh, that's a good question. I guess, I, I guess you're kind of right. I, I do remember the hard times a little bit more than, than the cushy times, but I think I like both. We all like both. You know, if it's all hard times, then it gets just, you know, it breaks you down and burns you out. But you know, if you have some good times and then you have these obstacles that come up, these hard times, that's okay. You can get through that. And I, I feel like that's kind of what it's been for MXPX is we've, we've gone, you know, we've gone through these hard times and then we can coast a minute and then hard times. Um, I would say a good example, there's a lot of good examples of that. Um, I was just mentioning the, the other tumble down story where we, we had to change our we had to put on chains and we didn't do it correctly everybody was trying to do it uh we ended up uh, the trotland brothers were out there and they were getting splashed with with you know water as big semi trucks were going by we were in the mountains in california and it was just kind of this crazy crazy storm and, and we were on our way from bremerton or portland it was portland played a show in portland left that night to play a show the next night in medford Medford? No, no, it was um, it was Stockton or or uh, something like that, like California, Northern California. Anyway, um, I have it tattooed, and I can't remember what the tattoo says. <laughs> but Earl, Earl, you know you're out there tattooed it on me that night. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think it was like Stockton or something like that. Um, Modesto, Modesto. I think it was Modesto. So. You know, this story doesn't have to be drawn out and long. Basically, we left that night and we got caught in the snowstorm, so we had to try to put on chains. Everybody's trying to put them on. We put them on. Uh, by the way, I was I was driving and and the, the Trotland brothers tried to put on these chains and they didn't put them on right and they fell off right away and so they got wrapped around the axle and so at this point we had chains wrapped around the axle instead of around our tires and couldn't go anywhere so we had to we spent hours trying to get those unwrapped around the axle of our our van finally did got off the exit went to the, to the rest stop there was a guy selling chains and also offering to put them on for you and so we bought a whole new set of chains for like i don't know 150 bucks or something like it was like way overpriced got back on the road got there no one slept. It was horrible. Um, that night, drank a bunch, partied, got tattooed, slept, stayed up late, and pretty much ran myself down to the with the wire and ended up getting sick. We were on a, a run where at the end of the run we were playing with Social Distortion, uh, opening for one of their shows in, in at the Fillmore in San Francisco. And we did end up playing the show, but I got so sick during that run that a couple of the shows, including Hollywood, I had no voice, couldn't sing at all, and I was just squeaking it out. <laughs> Not only that, during the, the Social Distortion show, I broke a string on my acoustic, so I couldn't sing, couldn't barely talk, so I can't like get my way out of this by like being charming. I had to like literally just scramble, grab a different guitar, tune it up. It, it was a nightmare situation, and I've had a lot of those nightmare situations I can think back to when MXPX opened for the Sex Pistols. Uh, this was 1997, I think. 97 sounds about right. It could 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 have been 99, but I think it was 97. They were coming through. We were playing. We were already playing Bumper Shoot uh, Festival, and they were doing a tour. And part of their tour was on the Bumper Shoot Festival, and they were playing. I think it was uh, Thunderbird Stadium. No, that's Bremerton Stadium. They were playing the stadium that like the the Huskies play. So Husky Stadium. Um, and one of their bands had to drop off the show, and so we were asked to play as the opener. And so we're like, yeah, yeah. So we played, and the show went pretty good. You know, I'm sure like some of the old punks hated us or whatever, but um, towards the end, actually, punk rock show, I broke 
a string on my bass. And back then I was playing with my fingers. Do 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 do. So okay, okay, I can deal with one string. I can move to a, to an octave. Playing, playing, playing. Broke another string. Two strings in one song, and it was the last song. And finally, I was just like, okay, well, all right. <laughs> See you later, Seattle. But, uh, you know, sometimes those things happen and, and it just makes you go, okay, well, I should change my strings every show or at least every other show. You know, you, you, you can figure out what, what to, to do to make that not happen again. And, and that, was, that was terrible. But um, a lot of things. Yeah, so, so the original question, like, what do I remember more? It's, it's really both. I remember <laughs> for, for, a, for, for the both reasons I remember this story, we... We left Warp Tour one year, probably 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. Um, we did, you know, the full two months, two and a half months. Sometimes you're doing 30, 30 shows in a row, 24 shows in a row, like something like that. Well, we did a full Warp Tour. Left, I, I think this was 2002 Warp Tour, and we left um, the tour at the end and flew to. Portugal. So we we're going to fly to Portugal and we had a festival show um, in Portugal. And then we had a, you know, then we were doing a full tour in Europe. So our flight was delayed from New York. It was New York, not New York. It, it was, yeah, it was New York. Um, one of the two New York airports. I can't remember which one. But, um, JFK probably we were delayed like seriously eight hours or something like that it took forever finally plane left and what happens we get there luggage is gone no guitars nothing no nothing we checked so now we're in Portugal with only the shirt off our back and our backpacks and things like that and um, we had to borrow gear and but by the time we got to the festival by the way our slot had been long past so we had to they found us a new slot which was about 1 a.m like 12 31 a.m after everything was done the foo fighters were headlining the main stage so they got us they got us a, a stage right across from it and so right when the foo fighters were done we started playing and we didn't have our, I didn't have my bass, I, you know, Tom didn't have his guitar, but we made it work. You know, we obviously, Yuri never has his drum sets usually, you know, on these flyouts, but um, we made it work and the crew stepped up and even, you know, we talked to Dave earlier, you know, Dave Grohl before the show and said, hey, you know, this happened, like we're here, we wanted to be here earlier, but uh, if you think of it, if you remember, let everybody know we're playing it right after you guys, right across the way. and. Uh, he did. At the end of their set, they're like, he's like, MXPX is playing right after us. Go see him. Have a great night. Dun, dun, dun. And then just a flood of people start making their way, uh, uh, many of which aren't coming to see us, of course, but we start jamming, you know, we start playing. What's up? Are you ready to, you know, I don't know what we did, maybe like Cheap Trick. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Hello there, ladies and gents. Are you ready to rock? That's not what we did, actually. But something like that, that's what it felt like. It was like, this was a moment, you know? And, and it ended up being a great show with a huge crowd. Uh, people, you know, a lot of people that, you know, would stay and watch for a while and then they move on because they were literally on their way leaving. But, um, you know, hopefully, you know, a lot of the, the fans that missed us earlier, hopefully, Saw, saw us, but but I don't doubt that a lot of those those people that wanted to see us probably missed us just altogether. But uh, it ended up being an amazing experience in Portugal. It was our first time playing Portugal, and um, we uh, from there. The reason I mentioned the story was it was a grueling, a grueling travel situation, and then we finally get there, and we have to wait till. We can't just play. We have to not only just we'll take we're t we took naps of course during the day that evening and stuff, but um, after the show we make it to the hotel about four, five a.m. Um, and it was such a nice hotel. It was so beautiful, just perfect. Everybody had their own room. We all go up to our big bed, cushy. It, we we're so tired. Take a shower. 
sink into the bed, just, oh my God. 25 minutes later, time to go. So like we literally had no time in the best hotel of the whole tour. And we remember that because it was such a nice hotel and we had no t if we had a lot of time in that hotel, it would have just been a nice hotel. You know, we've had other nice hotels, but we were so tired and we had a lobby call to make it back, you know, because we had to like catch up to our our regular tour schedule, our lobby call to fly to we were flying to Germany. We flew we flew into Hamburg and um we had a show there. Same thing, no clothes. I, th I think we we went to like a little market, a little like clothing supermarket kind of deal. Um and got some t-shirts, got some underwear, got a few things, you know, but still didn't have the gear, you know, so I'm playing somebody else's bass again. And finally, we did we did the whole European run like that. It was like a week and a half for two weeks. Our luggage just missing us everywhere. And finally, um, our tour manager, I think it was Tommy Rat. Uh, yeah, it was for sure. And he he's like, okay, we're just gonna send it to the last show in London. Uh, to our to our hotel or whatever and that's it so like we all got our luggage and except one guy got his luggage somewhere in Europe it was Meckler and he was like sort of like the, the lowest on the totem pole we love you Meckler if you're listening I'm sure you're not but <laughs> he was the guy we used we used uh, his name as an ad as a as a verb uh, or an adjective like to describe I got Mecklered out in the middle of nowhere I don't know if I'm using that correctly but I'm using Mecklerd correctly. I don't know if it's, a, it's an adverb or if it's a verb but uh, correctly. But the point is, is he was the only one that got his luggage before everyone else. And we're like, you jerk. But uh, we finally got everything at the end of the tour. And the next day we flew home. Flew home to the U.S. to start another tour, that is. We were on a pretty insane schedule. I think... Um, I think it was before everything and after was the album we were working. So, um, yeah, I remember that because it was just absolutely a nightmare not having any of our gear and any of our clothing. And, and you know, you kind of, when I pack, you know, after that, when I pack for tours, I would just think, okay, what can I what's cool but also what can i lose <laughs> you know what what am i not gonna I mean, there's no real clothing that i there's clothing i'm bummed that i lose you know i lost that bears shirt a long time ago i've got some promo shots of me wearing this bears chicago bears shirt there's another uh Can canadian canuck shirt i lost that was such a cool shirt vintage sports um nowadays maybe being such a hardcore seahawks fan i might not wear the Bears shirt but the Canuck shirt, I mean, that was such a cool shirt. I lost it somewhere on tour, but these days, you know, uh, I just wear mostly dark shirts, black shirts, uh, Anchor Valley wine shirts, you know, things like that. Um, West Side Archive shirts, things that I can I can replace those. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not too sentimental, but yeah. It's, things that happen to you along the way do change you, don't they? They change how you how you live, like, like uh, Fairly recently, my mom, she she had one of her hard drives with all her like personal, not MXP stuff, but personal photos and personal documents. It crashed out on her. It died, and she didn't have it backed up. And and uh, we forget that you know these things that we have, you know these these hard drives that we have are are they're just made, you know, by machines and people. And sometimes they're just they they fail and. We gotta fix them. But luckily, she she sent this out to some genius, some some techie genius, and he, for a fee, can fix it. And he put it everything out back on this little tiny zip drive, a USB zip drive, and uh, all as well. So, but uh, but it just shows you. I mean, you can lose everything. So I've been trying to really back up, double back up really important things digitally lately, and and. Um, but uh, when it comes to clothing, yeah, I mean, if I find shoes that I like, if I find a shirt I like, I want to get a bunch of that shirt. I know it's psychopathic, kind of, in a weird way, but it's true. I mean, I, I really do. Um, 
I probably said too much. Let's let's move on. Um, I've got way more stories when it comes to like obstacles, hard times, posh times. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to to be treated well. You know, when we were with the offspring, we got to go on on Dexter's plane. He has a, a jet. Uh, it's a it's a private jet, and it has a big. A anarchy symbol on the tail and <laughs> so it's very very punk rock and very fun and he's very very generous and very cool about uh, bringing uh, other bands support bands along the way so he did that and uh, that was fun it was a lot of fun got treated well I'm sure um, now looking back you know the, the extra hotel expense that we took uh, and we went we went from Dallas to Houston and, and stayed where they stayed which was a very nice place I'm sure that we paid for that on our recording budget, you know, for that album, which is why it's not recouped yet. But uh, <laughs> we've spent so much money in weird ways that I think we honestly didn't even understand and didn't think about. Definitely didn't think about, but definitely didn't understand um, back then. I don't I regret it. I don't regret it. it. It's it's a learning experience, always. Life is. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's times when you can just... It, Spend a little more money and have that experience, and that experience is worth the spending the money. I think that's absolutely a valid thing. I mean, a lot could be said about people coming to see shows. Coming to see shows, that's spending a little, a little bit more than you normally spend in your lot, your day to day life, or or a lot more than you would normally spend in your day to day life. But but those experiences make the rest of your life worth going through, right? Of course, the I mean, even without those experiences, it's worth going through. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I just mean, when we have events in our lives that are positive experiences, or even negative experiences that we get through and be can become a learning experience, that becomes a positive experience in the future for you, and really has for us as a band. You know, we've learned a lot over the years, and so, yeah, uh, you know, a, a lot of times we bitch and complain, especially when you like, songwriters bitch and complain about things in songs. But you know, I think about we got to go through the hard times to 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 steal ourselves for the future, to be stronger. So, yeah. All right. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Let's uh, let's get to the next one. Mike Herrera. This is Torben Dulcher calling from Denver, Colorado. I actually grew up in Washington State. I'm a Washingtonian like yourself, Eastern Washington, Proster Washington to be exact. And I grew up listening to punk rock, and I love your band. I love your podcast. I love your music. Thank you for what you do. Just had a quick question. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of MXPX, but I'm also a huge fan of Newfound Glory. Recently, at a Newfound Glory show here in Denver, I actually saw your logo tattooed to Jordan's arm. I was really up close. It was one of the few times I was up close and saw that. Can you please explain that? Did somebody lose a bet on tour? Um, anyway, I was just curious about that whole story. Is there a backstory behind that? I'd love to hear more about that. Your little punk head logo was tattooed to Jordan's arm. I don't know if there's a connection there. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that on your podcast or you know, any of that sort of information. Because you explained recently in a previous podcast about your tattoo and the meaning behind the bird and all that great stuff. Anyway, it's a great story. I listen to your podcast every single week, and I really look forward to hearing it when I drive all the way to work when I commute. So thank you for what you do. Please pump it out. Keep the music, keep pumping out good music and your podcast. And I love you, man. Thank you for what you do. Talk to you soon. Bye. Word up. Thank you so much, man. Thank, I, that means a lot. I appreciate it. It's cool to, to visualize you driving on your commute, listening. Dun, dun, dun. Listen to the, the tattoo stuff. Yeah, the tattoo stuff. Um, I mean, that's the thing. That, that stuff doesn't always come up unless I do like one of these voicemail episodes and, and we kind of talk about me stuff. Uh, most of the time, it, it's focused even though you know, I'll interject my stories and stuff, but it's focused on the guest. So uh, yeah, these, these voicemail ones are fun. Um, Jordan, Jordan, we should, I need to have him on the podcast to, to ask him about his MXPX tattoo, but um, I just, 
you know, we're friends. We've we've known Newfound Glory since really before anybody really. Um, we took them on their first real tour around Florida, around the Southeast, and um, and then they they really took off from there. But uh, they they've always had that work ethic. They've always had that get up and go, and um, and they've they've stuck together through that. So. Um, Jordan is, he probably lost a bet, <laughs> but I didn't give him that tattoo. No, um, he, he must have got that from a, a, a bro of his, and he probably has a couple other band tattoos, I would assume, maybe like a, maybe a Descendants tattoo, but uh, he's a fan of MXPX, I know that, but we're also friends, so, uh, you know, that that's, that, that, that's flattering to me. You know, I know that there's uh, a, a lot of other band guys out there in the scene, associates of mine that are maybe a little younger than us, that grew up listening to MXPX and then started their own band. That that exists out there for sure. Um, it's cool that you got close enough to Jordan's arm that you could see that. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Eastern Washington is a, a crazy place. It's, it's like frontier land to me. But I really dig it. I caught my first fish out in Eastern Washington. I got some uh, relatives of uh, on my mom's side out there. Anyway, um, let's uh, let's get to the next one. All right, thank you. That was that was a cool call. Hey, Mike. My name is Jonathan, and I've been a fan since 1997. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I have a question about uh, making records. Um, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons? of working with a producer on a record, and what are the pros and cons of doing a record self-produced, as I know you've had the opportunity to do both. And secondly, when the hell is Feldy going to produce an MXPX record? Because I'm sure that would be fire. Thanks <laughs> so much. Bye. Right on. All right, Jonathan. Um, you know, we've uh, obviously we've thought about Feldy and producing, and you know what? It might happen someday. Um, but... MXPX is definitely my brainchild, and Goldfinger is Feldy's, and I think I've talked about this a little bit before. And Feldy is a like there's a very specific sound and an I you know style, and if we want to do something like that, which we might some sometime, you know, might have a song that would fit, then yes, I would love to have Feldy produce, mix, anything like that. Um, I, I love him to death, and he he does great work. Um, MXPX is a little bit more on the natural side of like we try to try to make things sound like like believable and like you could hear it in the same room as you rather than coming from this like perfect place. Um, that's probably a pretty simplistic way of there's a lot more that goes into like what Feldy does versus maybe what MXPX has been doing. Um, but to answer your question, let's go right into a lot of the reasons why we've done a lot of self-producing versus other uh, having other producers come in um, is just because we kind of we if you already know what you want it to sound like and you think you can get it yourself by all means you know if the songs are there I think um, I think let's break it down into pros and cons like you asked uh, pros of pros of rent uh, of <laughs> pros of hiring uh, a producer are you're gonna get a lot more guidance. You're gonna have an extra person, an extra creative person to help guide you through that process of making that album. Um, and that's everything, and it depends on the producer as well because not all producers are alike. There's so many different styles of producing. There's hands-on producing, there's songwriting, you know, there's, there's just uh, performance producing. I, I'm making up these terms. I don't think these are real terms, but uh, what I mean by that is, is, I guess I should break it down a little more. Hands-on producing is, I want you to change this part exactly like this. Um, and there's spectrums of that. Uh, so that's also partly songwriting producing. Uh, here's a, here, you know, that could be songwriting producing is when you actually the producer's writing with you or writing and then giving you, here's the part, the new part I wrote for you, here you go. Uh, there's that style, and then there's hands-on producing, which is <clears throat> maybe not writing the song, but telling you, hey, rewrite that part, which we do a lot of that uh, ourselves, and you know, through, like, say, Tom Chichilla produces MXPX. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to him about songs before they're finished, and we'll, like, 
okay, let me fix this part of this part. That's happened to a, you know, a handful of songs. It doesn't happen all the time. But that's hands-on, I would say, hands-on producing. And then there's, um, you know, performance producing, like I said, is when you're up there and you're, you're, you're not changing any of the song, you're just listening to what's being recorded. And then you tell the artist, do that again. That needs to be better. That needs to be tighter. That needs that was out of tune. Hey, why don't you tune and then let's try another take. Like that's like performance producing, I guess. You know, because you're really producing the performance of the artist. Um, you're not pro you're, you're producing the song because that's part of it. But you're you're not writing the song and you're not telling them to rewrite the song. So, um, you know, there's there's some producers that do all of that. You know. Um, I would say, I would say John Feldy would be a producer that kind of does all that. He's, he writes, he, he, he's hands on. He tells you to like, he probably would hand you a new part and be like, try this. Um, but he also, when you're singing in the booth, is like, try it one more time, try this, try it this way. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's all different types. Um, as far, you know, if you want to know what type of producer I am, it really depends on, on what the artist wants. Because if the artist needs help with songs, I'm free to, let's prop this up, let's fix this, let's tweak this lyric. And if there's a lot of songwriting stuff and I'm doing it on everything, then sure, I'll take a songwriting credit. But usually I'll just do that as part of, it's just part of my job as a producer. And from there, you know, this, you know what does the record sound like? Engineering is is making everything sound good and and physically putting the placing the microphone and and patching a cable to you know the patch bay and the la the last uh, we were talking about patch bays and stuff on on a past episode and I didn't mention that we were talking about you know t telephone wires like somebody making a telephone patch bay into a real patch bay well that's actually what I have upstairs it's a TT patch bay which is tiny telephone patch bay it it's, was invented for telephone and then it became used for audio like pro audio and all that so yeah that's what engineers do and a lot of producers do engineering and producing some engineers just engineer which is like push record and do all the technical stuff and mic everything and make sure the pre it's going to the preamps and you have your like signal chain um, and then yeah, and then some. You know, you have your producer that sits next to him or on the couch back there and just listens to what's happening and gives notes. And you have a talkback mic and and all of that. So, so yeah, pros and cons. Back to that. Um, that's a lot, you know. So so produce. So if you need a producer, what kind of producer? So the pros are there's all types of producers. It's another. It's it's just somebody that really is a professional that's meant to help you make your record way better than it would be without them. So, that being said, there's like people like Michael Beinhorn that are like notorious for, for if you hire them, they're gonna triple your budget, meaning they're gonna waste so much money on things that don't really matter, like building, I think on the Social Distortion, um, White Light, White Heat, he built a box, that the drums or not the drums but the like that the guitar was in or something like that that the guitar cabinet was in and it was supposed to be like to to shield it from the electromagnet ground thing coupling you know like <laughs> it was just this weird thing and uh <laughs> And like they, they sat there and built this thing for like a week in the studio, and like they're paying for studio time the whole time. Like it was just insane. Like hearing stories like that are reasons why you might not want to get a producer. So so cons of uh, cons of getting a producer would be, you know, I, I, okay, let's just let's not go pros and cons. Let's just say pros of not getting a producer. <laughs> pros of self-producing. That would be that would be just not ha not having less expensive, you save money. Two, you have just less cooks in the kitchen. You, you can still collaborate with other people and self-produce. Um, so I think just control over your project and how it sounds. Um, I don't know, I think, I think 
a, a combination of both is what we've sort of settled on lately is, you know, we have who we're working with, you know, recording wise as a part producer, we have Tom Chichilla as a part producer, we have myself and all the guys in the band as part producers. And, and that's pretty much what we need. And someday we might go, I mean, I mean, that we could go to just a single, this person's producing, we're not even producing, but I don't know, we're always producing these days, you know, that's the thing, it's a collaboration, it's not just, it's not like it was back in the day where you have one job and that's it. it nowadays you kind of have so many jobs to do, and um, and I think that's why it's okay, it's okay to to do a little bit of this and a little bit of this and you don't have to have all or nothing. We live in a world where all or nothing, I don't know, it's usually not the best answer to our, our problems. All right, let's move on. Let's do one more. We'll wrap this puppy up. All right, thank you guys so much for listening. And uh, well, like, like always, no commercials. So thanks for listening to MXPX. Thanks for going to MXPX.com and ordering things off the store. We're always putting new stuff up there. Uh, for those that don't know, my mom, Michelle Herrera, my mom, has always been involved with the band, but uh, the last few years she's been just running our web store, runs the merch arsenal, and she also prints some of our t-shirts that we sell. Um, some of the one the one color stuff that she can do, um, she'll print herself, which I love. I think DIY is, it's just in our, in our roots. It's not only in our roots and in our blood, it's still here. It's part of the foundation of MXPX. So let's get to uh, one more voicemail and and then we'll we'll call it. All right. Hey, what's up, Mike? This is Jesse from St. Louis. Uh, just wanted to ask you a little bit about the recording process of uh, Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo. It's, uh, one of my all-time favorite albums. Sounds great. Just uh, was wondering if you could get to the background story of kind of what it what went into that recording session and where your guys heads were at that time uh yeah if you could just talk about that album i'd appreciate it i saw you guys one time live opening for lag wagon at pop in sauge illinois uh right outside of st louis uh, but yeah thanks for all the music and uh really appreciate you take care that's a cool that's a cool topic, Jesse. Thanks for calling in. Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo was our very first major label album. And because of that, everything kind of changed. We had a bigger budget all of a sudden. We had more time to, to record it. Um, I remember going, you know, we went to to start the beginning of when I what I really remember is we were practicing while we were touring. We were practicing for for the recording, you know, the new songs. And we went to Tony from, I can't remember his last name, but Tony from from the band, the Supertones, the OC Supertones, he was the bass player. And we went to his house, because he had like a little garage, like practice set up, band set up, and we went to his house and, and practiced songs that we're gonna end up on slowly going the way of the buffalo. One of them was, um, don't tell me I've changed. I can't remember the name of that song, but uh, we played it on, on one of the live streams uh, over the summer, but I still can't remember the name of the song. Um, but we played, you know, a couple of those types of songs, you know, it was real kind of, you know, what were we thinking going into that record? I, I don't know. I, I guess, I guess we were, you know, we had Steve Kravak producing and he produced Life in General. And so we brought him back on to produce Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo, and he came he came up to, to, to Seattle. It wasn't Bremerton, it was Seattle. And I wonder, I'm trying to remember now, did he come up to Bremerton for a couple of days? And we, do, we did pre-production, but this was before we had a studio or anything, so it would have, it would have been a practice sessions. 
I don't remember that. I don't, I don't remember that, but it's possible. I'd have to ask Tom and Yuri. Um, but going into this record, you know, of course we were thinking, okay, major, la major label record. And same with Steve Kravak. He was, he kind of went crazy thinking this is an important record. I have to really deliver this major label record. And he, he overdid it. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, not only were we playing everything drum wise, like with Jerry on drums, like for hours and hours for one song, it's perfect. Yeah, Yuri's played it perfect. And he'll go through and and measure um, with a measuring tape the tape. We were recording to two inch tape. So he's measuring and taking slices out of anything that was like anywhere off. So he made it like a like perfect. So he's doing things that people do with with like beat detective nowadays. He, he was doing to tape. And we didn't really understand what was going on. We're just like, I'm sure it'll sound good, <laughs> you know? He didn't do that with life in general. Um, but that's why Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo is so kind of perfect, I guess, in a way. And there is there is one error. There is one error that fundamentally changed the part that when you hear the error, if you knew the song, you would go, that's messed up. But because of the part that it was messed up on, we literally just played over that. And by the time, because by the time, by the time we realized what it was, and I almost don't want to say what what song it was, but it's on Buffalo, and there there is a fundamentally messed up part rhythmically because. He cut out a part accidentally, and then we came back. And we when, once it, it was already done, and we we're like recording to it. And I don't know. I think we recorded guitars first, and then bass. And I was the one that noticed because obviously the bass line. I mean, it's all bass line. I you know, it, I'm getting a little bit into the weeds on on details maybe with this record, but um, but yeah, I'm just thinking like he he went crazy making it perfect and in and, and at the same time he steve was great i mean we had a great time recording with him i don't mean he, he literally went crazy went a little crazy he started smoking cigarettes during like in the studio in the control room We're like dude it's gonna be all right um but those guys were staying up till like four five a.m when the sun was coming up they'd be walking back to our little apartment we rented. Before Airbnb existed, we just rented this like apart, this ha section of a house, downstairs of a house, and um, had bedrooms, and we'd just come and go as we please. And it, it was a, I, I gotta say, I think it was where, where the first three albums, um, ending with Life in General, were all similar to, to each other in where we crammed a lot of songs into a short amount of time recording. Record, record, record. We really only had time to go eat. And so like all my memories around those records involve people and eating. And that's about it. You know, maybe sleeping arrangements as well. You know, uh, I think life in general, we slept on uh, Elise Rogers from Dancehall Crashers floor for half the record. Um, and then uh, another friend's floor for another half that was way further away. That's why we moved down to, to Elise's because she was in Hollywood and we were recording in Hollywood. Anyway, like things like that I remember, but but with, with Buffalo, we finally have so much more time. We're waiting for Steve to like do edits. So we have all this time on our hands to experience new other things now that we're also 21. I think we're 21, yeah. I think we're 21 by now and we go to the liquor store and we buy all sorts of malt liquors everything we can everything we see that we've been curious about mad dog 2020 night train uh mickey's big big mouth we had had before so we didn't have to try that uh but things like that you know um we got all sorts of you know different things like Goldschlager and Jägermeister. Like the, these were the days when we didn't know anything about drinking alcohol, and we're looking to make it palatable because nothing tasted good. I remember looking over it as Tom would take a sip of anything, beer, uh, 
be any, for years. Beer, you know, liquor, vodka, whiskey, and he loves whiskey and beer, but still, almost still, he'll like do that little uh, taste to it, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. But I remember Buffalo was really when we first are kind of, with each other as a small group, really just drank together. And we would drink at the house, we'd drink at the studio, and we made like weird little skits. Um, there's a skit that ended up on, on the end of one of our one of our DVD, it was, it was a VHS tape, I think it was called It Came From Bremerton. But uh, we made a skit because we were so bored in the studio, we just made, made like um, these, what do you call those, um, dioramas. <laughs> we made a diorama of our band on a stage, drum set, Tom, Yuri, me, you know, with microphones, and then like we played the song and like did a video of that. Like that's, we, we had cabin fever, but we called it studio fever, of course, where, especially Yuri back in those days, cause he would be done with the drums so early and then we, so, he would have so much time just sitting there with nothing to do. So, yeah, we were thinking, let's make a great record and I almost, I mean, there's a lot, there, there's things I definitely would have changed about Buffalo, but it, it's funny because people really love it. They're like, that's a perfect record and this and that. And we trusted in that, in that respect, we trusted Steve Kravak as a producer. We didn't, we didn't question much. We didn't question when he's like, take out that drum fill, no drum fills on this song at all. We're like, all right. You know, Yuri's like, okay, that's easier. You know, but... It didn't need to be as perfect as as it kind of turned out to be, but at the same time, it sounds great. You know, like I have no no real complaints about it. So, uh, you know, for for me, it's like a, lear a le huge learning experience on the type of record I like to make as well. So, like moving moving, you know, the next record we made was the Ever Passing Moment with uh, Jerry Finn, and he was a much more relaxed producer. Still hands-on where he would be like, maybe cut that part down a little bit, um, see how you can transition that better. But he didn't really get too far into it. You know, he would he would focus on the performances. Um, definitely a performance producer, um, for, with us anyway. And, but, but we were ready for it by that point because we had Kravak to kick our asses for two records in a row because um, the first couple records were just learning, I think they were learning experiences for our producers, Aaron Sprinkle and Bob Moon, just the same as it was for us. They were in over their heads a little bit. And then I think C. Kravak was a little bit in over his head too, or at least he wasn't, but he acted like he was, you know? He was like, ah, I gotta make this perfect. But like really, if he just would have captured us the way he did, and he did, it was fine. It was great. He did a great job. He was just so stressed about it. But uh, yeah, there's all the, when you're not ready for an easygoing producer, that easygoing producer is not gonna is not gonna make you sound good. Um, you need a hardcore producer to make to to make you to. It's like a teacher. It's like you know you, you go to first grade, second grade, third grade, different style of teaching in those grades and. The, when you get further on, you get into college, usually you have, you, this teaching style goes a little bit lax, meaning I'm gonna tell you this, if you don't listen, that's up to you and do your thing, you know? And it, maybe that's an oversimplification of it, but I feel like with us, we had to go through, um, we had those learning experiences with Aaron Sprinkle, like, okay, this is weird, this is cool, I like this, let's not do that. Same thing with Bob Moon. This is great. Let's not do one guitar for the record and then just pan a delay, you know, like things like that. Like, let's not do that again. Like, very strange things. But like, we didn't know back then, and and so finding and then going through our phases with with Steve Kravak, having him just truly make us a better band. He made he was in there performance, performance, performance. Do it again. Do it again. But not only do it again. Do it. He would like explain in a good way like how to do it. Um, and it really made us the band we are today. I mean, we've really, you know, that that brought us to the next level. So, Steve is great. It allowed Jerry, uh, 
Jerry Finn to be a little less hardcore and just let us do our thing and just push record, make the thing sound amazing. And it's been like that for the, you know, for everybody we've used since then. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, Dave Jordan was great. Um, Gavin McKillop on Panic was great. All in their own ways, we had great experiences with them. So, and I think that's kind of why we keep trying new people is because we just always have a great experience and, and, and it's not, but we also also always want a new experience and the world changes so quickly these days. So for all those reasons, um, it, you know, we always have some sort of, some sort of sounding board um, to, to throw an idea off of, but I usually don't do that until, until I'm pretty, pretty happy with the process myself. All right, that was a great way to end it. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning into the podcast. I appreciate you. If you want to uh, call in yourself or call in again, you can call me, leave a voicemail, 360-830-6660. One more time, write it down, type it in, area code 360-830-6660. MXPX.com, always the place to support what we do here on the podcast, what uh, what we do in the band. And like I said, exciting things coming up. Thanks for being patient. Thanks for uh, just listening to all your favorite stuff. Uh, and I appreciate you. Appreciate you for listening. Um, one more thing, Bob McKnight. Shout out to Bob McKnight for editing and producing the podcast. I appreciate you, Bob. Check out his podcast, The Bob and Katie Show, everywhere you stream your podcast, everywhere you listen to. If you're listening here, you might as well listen to him. Same spot. Um, his is different. It's less about music, more about life, more about just funny things that happen and uh, kind, of, kind of comedic. Yeah, it's pretty fun. All right, you guys, that's it. Um, I will see you next week with someone that lives in Texas. My guest lives in Texas. So we will we'll hear from her. All right. Can you guess who it is? You pro Some of you can. Some of you can. All right. We haven't done the interview yet, so it's possible that it doesn't happen. And then I'm like, oh, crap. Well, that's not the next one. But I think so. I think so. All right, you guys. That's it. 395 is over and done. I appreciate you. I've said that a million times, but it's because I mean it. And it's also the only thing I know how to say. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.